Let's continue exploring our Windows environment, our newly configured installation of MySQL. So there are a number of things that we'd like to do. First, let's take a look at the directory structures that have been set up by MySQL. Let's launch computer, then navigate to C program files. We know that the binary files were installed here in MySQL version, and here's the structure. This is the default configuration file, my.ini, the equivalent of my.cnf. Our environment by default doesn't show suffixes, which is why you don't see it, but they're double clickable, which will invoke Notepad by default, so we can interact with any of these files. There are also other config files, just like over on the Nix side, which will allow you to retweak your server, for example, to support InnoDB with large tables, four gig or greater tables, or large, medium, and small configurations, or a template that you can use to generate configurations, perhaps with a Perl script. So the my.ini file, when you double click on it, will bring up Notepad. And here's our instance. It's heavily commented, just like the my.cnf over on the Nix side. It includes header sections that pertain to the different clients. So that remains the same for simplicity and cross-platform compatibility. So clients that subscribe to or read the client block will process directives from this block, including to use a default port of 3306. Clients that read MySQL will use a default character set of UTF-8. And many of the other settings here pertain to the service itself, MySQLD. For example, the service listens to port 3306. If we wanted to force it to bind to a specific IP, like we did on the Nix side, we could specify bind equals in the IP address that it should bind to. Its base directory is where the top level container is located, the root of the installation. The data directory for my ISIM files defaults to C program data, MySQL, MySQL Server 5.1, and that can be changed as well to a different location. If it doesn't exist, then it could either throw an error if it fails to create the directory or otherwise. So if you navigate to C, look for program data, and it shouldn't be on the C drive. This is something that we can move altogether to the D drive. So that's something to keep in mind. So it's going to set up its database items beneath the path that you see listed. The server defaults to UTF-8 as we indicated. And notice that it's actually set the default storage engine to InnoDB because of what we specified in the configuration wizard. So that explains why we don't see the directory created because it's going to default to the D drive. If So if we navigate to the D drive quickly, you'll see that in the MySQL directory will be the InnoDB file. So let's navigate to that directory. And there's the InnoDB file. So databases will be modeled there when generated. But we'll see that momentarily. And the maximum number of concurrent connections, since we said the server is going to be a busy server, is set to a high value of 800. And my ISAM settings, key buffer size, sort buffer size, items that we had to manipulate recently when performing checks using either MySQL check or MySQL check. And the InnoDB data home directory, dmysql, which is what we specified during installation. The memory pool used by InnoDB and a number of other items. The idea is if you're going to support transactional processing, you should use InnoDB. So long as you store your data on a volume that is fast, and protected using perhaps RAID, some level of RAID. So our data will be in dmysql. The config hierarchy is in C program files, mysql, mysql version. The client utilities are located in bin. So in here we'll find the different utilities that will run from time to time, such as myisim check, if we have myisim tables, the terminal monitor client itself, mysql, MySQL admin, which can be used to perform administrative functions like starting and stopping the server and changing a user's password, for example. The server itself, MySQLD, 
which we inadvertently double clicked, MySQL check, which we've just looked at for checking online my ISAM, as well as other types of tables. MySQL D debug, MySQL import, which allows you to import data from other sources, such as text files or SQL text files, MySQL show, and a number of other items. So the binaries are located in the bin directory. Docs, any documentation that pertains to the service itself, like the change log comes up, you have to associate it with a program such as Notepad or WordPad to read the change log. And it's not properly formatted in Notepad, so WordPad will be able to read the delimiters a little bit better. You just have it open with WordPad as opposed to Notepad. Since it doesn't have the suffix declared, then we'll just skip it for now. Shared components, such as languages, libraries, any plugins that need to be loaded, such as the InnoDB DLL, and so on. Additional plugins that are required will be stored in that directory as a result. Now you can always reconfigure the server by navigating to Start All Programs to the MySQL group, where you'll find the configuration wizard beneath the version. So this is the instance configuration wizard. This allows you to reconfigure the server, let's say to use a different storage engine. Let's just go through the exercise since we're here. So we'll reconfigure the instance. You may also remove it. An instance, since we installed the full package, we have the instance manager. That's this, the instance configuration wizard. We'll select a detailed option. And it's a server machine, not dedicated because it's functioning as something else. If we select non-transactional, then only my ISAM will be turned on. If we select multifunctional, then InnoDB is the default, but my ISAM is still there. Transaction processing, this usually sways towards the InnoDB configuration because it's faster. If we selected OLAP, since we didn't select that the last time, for example, default to 3306, multilingualism, UTF-8, include the directory. It's already installed as a server, so all this will really do is change the my.ini configuration file. We do need to indicate the password for root, current and new. So let's go ahead and specify that so that it knows. And let's wildcard the user so that we can connect from remote servers. Now the script will run to update my.ini. And when we double click on it momentarily, you'll see that the new directives have been written and now the service has been restarted with this new configuration. So that's the beautiful thing about MySQL. Making changes is relatively easy because they're largely based on the directives defined in my.ini. So this makes it very easy to make changes to the server. So we're still following the same settings for client access, the port, the UTF-8 character set handling. Now notice the data directory is specified again as program data. So that hasn't been, but the default storage engine has been changed to my ISAM as opposed to InnoDB. And the maximum connections has been set to a more sensible 100 concurrent for our environment since it's a classroom environment. So we didn't necessarily need 800 simultaneous connections. Now, the data directory is still set to C program data so that's something you have to be sure exists. And let's go ahead and just confirm our current C layout. So program data does not show up. So let's see what happens when we connect and create a database container. So let's close the config file for a moment. And then we'll maximize our DOS window. We'll rerun NetStat to be sure that it's still running. And you'll see that 3306 is still bound. Let's just mark it. So let's MySQL connect with our standard options. Now if you don't specify a user and you just indicate to have the server prompt you, it does attempt to connect to the default local host. But notice it def denied the user ODBC. So it's defaulting to a user named ODBC as opposed to a user named root. So something to keep in mind that on the win side it isn't stripping out the user variable and equating administrator to root. 
as is the case on the next side, which defaults to root. So let's rerun that MySQL, this time user root, and prompt for password. And then submit the password. And this propels us, of course, into the terminal monitor. It reveals the version. And if we want some information about the server, we can use the status escape sequence, which is backslash s. This is something we haven't covered much, but it's something I actually use often to see the details concerning my connection and the server at any given time. So the status returns useful info. The distribution version, we like to turn the mark on. The connection ID, we're currently using three. The current database, none, we didn't indicate a database. The current user, we're logged in as root at localhost. We indicated root and we're connecting from localhost. SSL is currently not in use, but could be. Default delimiter, semicolon, which is what we specify when we terminate SQL statements. Again, the version, 5145. The protocol version, 10. The connection, we're connected via localhost via TCP IP on the loopback adapter and the character sets UTF-8 to cover the world's languages the port 3306 and how long the connection has been the server has been up we've been connected for about a minute or so but how long the server has been up and then towards the bottom the number of threads questions asked at the time that our query was run any queries that are slow such as something that's scanning through a table that's got 50 million records number of connections open, or number of items open, that is, flush tables, open tables, number of open tables, queries per second, so on. Let's rerun it, and now the server is up about four minutes, and that's a running count. So backslash s is a nice escape sequence to return useful information to you. You are already familiar with, from the Nix side, show engines. Show engines returns the engines that are configured for this instance of MySQL. Due to our reconfiguration, MyISAM is now the default storage engine. CSV, and if you look at the columns, you'll see engine, support, so the next column is whether or not it's supported. So CSV is currently supported, but not the default. So the engine, whether or not it's the default, whether or not it's supported, is listed. There can only be one default. My ISAM is the default. So InnoDB we see is currently not set. So we don't have support for it. It's disabled because we went with the last option during the reconfig. But My ISAM works again for our intents and purposes. Let's do a show grants, which shows us our current user connected to the server. We're connected as root at localhost, which is really an account that's defined by default. So this isn't the root at percent account. But nonetheless, there are multiple roots ac accounts or multiple root accounts defined with full privileges. The full privileges are reflected with the grant statement. So grant all privileges on all databases and all tables to this user root at localhost, identified by a password with a password hash. Now, quick note about passwords and connectivity to MySQL. When you connect, the password is exchanged in a secure manner, but all subsequent statements, which are generally SQL statements, are transmitted in the clear, which is why using an SSH tunnel as what we've done is a suggested one of the suggested methods of encrypting communications between the client and the server, which includes the encryption of the password as well as the subsequent SQL statement. So the bulk of what you do between the client and the server goes unencrypted. The exchange of the hash is gibberish. This is the password hash, which doesn't mean much to users in between or men in the middle, if you will, or a man in the middle. So show grants shows us our current grants. Now, of course, if we select star from mysql.user, this will enumerate the different users that are defined. Root at localhost, that's the default account with MySQL, and then root at percent, as we've mentioned. They both have the same password. You can see that from the hash that's used. So, and they both have full privileges. These are the only two accounts that are currently defined on the system, which leads us to another idea. Perhaps we should define another user as a task, an ad hoc task. 
So to define a user, we use the grant statement. Let's launch an instance of Notepad, dump it there, then copy and paste it. So we'll grant all privileges on all databases dot all tables or a specific database, let's say MySQL dot all tables or a specific database and a specific table. So all databases, all tables to the user, Linux CBT at percent so that the user can connect from any system. Identified by in between single quotes the password. Let's go with a simple ABC123 with the grant option to give the user the option to grant privileges as well. So this is the definition of another super user that will be defined momentarily. Let's control A to select this full block and then return to the terminal monitor and then we'll right button paste it. It's not a putty window so it doesn't automatically paste for us and in fact it pasted the wrong item that we just inadvertently copied. So let's copy this again and clear what's here and try to paste it once more. We had some text blocked which is why it automatically showed up. So let's execute the grant and now let's select star from mysql.user and there we see the newly defined user Linux CBT at percent which means any user or any connecting client that identifies himself as a user of Linux CBT from any host, any connecting client will be able to connect so long as the password is proper and MySQL is listening on a routable port, a routable IP address and on a port that we've agreed to. So that took three one hundredths of a second to create the account and it didn't return any rows, it simply inserted a record into the user table in the MySQL database. So now we have a new user. Now, whenever you define new users, it's always advised that you flush privileges. Otherwise, you'll run the risk of not being able to connect immediately as that user. So flush privileges is what is to be executed post user definition or user creation. So let's paste this into our terminal monitor and the privileges will be flushed momentarily. And of course we should test connectivity as this user so let's quit backslash Q and instead of connecting as root we'll connect as a user Linux CBT have it prompt us for a password indicate the simplistic ABC123 and now we have a session backslash S shows that we're connected as the user at the host SSL's not in use and the other settings server's been up just about ten and a quarter minutes and the connection ID is 4 because we just closed out connection 3. Let's reconnect and see what's assigned now with backslash s and now our connection ID 4 or ID 5 after we were just ID 4 and let's run it again with the E option and indicate backslash s as an alternate means of running it without actually occupying a connection and notice it doesn't take it from the shell. Now that begs the question since the differences between Windows and Linux sometimes boils down to simply a single quote versus a double quote, notice it works with a double quote. So there's one little caveat to look out for. So oftentimes when you use single quote within Linux for escaping, that'll be double quote or that translates to double quotes on the Windows side. So there we can see that MySQL ups the connection ID by one per connecting client. So now we have a new user and that user can grant privileges, create databases, so on and so forth. So let's connect and enter the interactive mode and execute show databases to see what databases are defined. And there are three databases. Test, Information Schema, MySQL. If we wanted to create a database such as LCBT prods demos for the importation of data, we certainly could using the create database table. Now what about binaries like the my show or my MySQL show or those other items? Let's go to program files, MySQL, and we'll just tab this out until it gets to the M section. And this will take us there momentarily. 
And now in this directory, let's navigate into the default directory. Tab completion also works within Windows 2008, then into bin. So here are our different binaries. Included is MySQL show. So MySQL show, and let's just help it out a bit here, with no options, returns an error because it tries to connect locally. As the user Linux CBT to the local host prompting for the password, then it shows us the default databases. So we can use that as well. And of course, we can drill down specifying a database as well as, just like we do on the NIC side, a specific table such as proc. And it'll just drill down and show us the structure of proc, which includes its default character set as UTF-8 and so on. So the MySQL show command works just as it does on the NIC side. So no need to worry. Whatever you do on the Win side will translate to the NIC side and vice versa. So we've got the MySQL terminal monitor. We've got MySQL show and a number of other utilities. There's even MySQL import to import data from the other side. MySQL test, MySQL manager, my ISAM check to check your tables, so on. Now how about configuring the service to start with the account that we created, MySQL. Let's navigate to services.msc. This will bring up the service manager. And then once it comes up, we'll navigate to the MySQL account, the service that is, and change it to the MySQL account. So let's navigate to MySQL, change it from the local system. Now, if we scroll through, we'll see exactly how the server starts. It reads the my INI but it doesn't specify the user on the command line. We can browse for an account. This brings up the search tool, which allows us to search for a user in the directory. There's the user, but we didn't actually specify a password, so it's using a default, which isn't the right password. Click OK, and then we'll restart the service momentarily. And the account has been auto-granted log on as a service. So of course this won't take effect until we restart the service. So if we've provided the right password, MySQL should be able to start. So notice it had a login error. Let's just try it again. We must have indicated the wrong password, which now means of course any connections that were open will fail. So let's try to connect once more. And you'll notice that it'll fail to connect us to the server and it times out because it's not able to connect. So let's change the password once more to the appropriate password just to show you that if the service doesn't start, don't expect to be able to connect using some other means like a Unix domain socket, for example. Now let's try to start the service since it's no longer running. And if the password's correct, then the service will start. So we did create the account. So we'll switch this back and debug that offline. Chances are there's an issue either with the password or with the way MySQL is starting up. So we'll just put it back to the local system account since it works that way, apparently, and run it that way. So this starts up nicely, and we're back to having the service run. So let's go back to our notes of possibilities. We've granted access to a username Linux CBT. We have been able to connect locally as root as well as Linux CBT. But we have yet to test connecting to remote systems and from remote systems. So supposing we wanted to connect as a user root to a remote system, we'd use the MySQL terminal monitor as an example utility with the user account prompt for password and the host's ID. In this case, we have it running on a SUSE box, so we'll connect there. It'll prompt us for authentication. And then we should be presented momentarily. And the password is incorrect. Let's try it again. We'll be presented with the terminal monitor interface once it connects to the remote side. So long as the port 3306 is available, it should be able to pick up and let us in. And let's try it again. The password is off. Whenever it comes back using password, yes. Although you've specified a password, it means the password is incorrect. Remember, there's an account that's defined for all hosts, which has a different password from the accounts that are defined for local host and the FQDN of the server. 
So here we are with connection ID 4, backslash s shows the details, and shows the version, connectivity, so on and so forth. And we're on the system, we can show databases. This one's been up for 50 minutes, 22 seconds. And here are the databases on that remote side. So we can interact, we can dump data, import data. Let's see from the NIC side how the Windows TCP service appears, perhaps using Nmap as an example. So let's go to our PuTTY window and we'll Nmap the target server 105. We could even do a service detection to see what it comes back with. SV will give us even more details. So this is going to perform a scan against the 105 host, which is the Windows 2008 host, and attempt to return us some useful information about the published ports and the services running behind those published ports. So it's found a number of ports open on the target, including 3306, as well as terminal services, Active Directory, both LDAP secure and not so secure, 389 and 636, as well as Kerberos on 88, and a number of other items. Now, it usually takes a longer time to resolve the service names and versions behind the ports, but this will tell us what it sees. We can also scan using IPv6. We know that the default Nmap scans version 4 of IP since version 4 is still the default version of IP. So this will take a while to come back. In a separate window we could get our IPv6 address. Let's drop the session quickly and execute an IP config which returns our IPv6 routable address as well as the link local address. Let's mark it so that we can submit it to the NIC side and perform an IPv6 scan. So that's marked it, and if we try to paste it to the shell, it should paste, so we have the address. Now back to the Nmap window. Let's see what it's determined for 3306. It's found the version, 5145. It's MySQL. It's open. And it believes that the server is a 3COM-based server or a server that's connected with a 3COM card, and that's true since the prefix on the NIC belongs to 3COM. So, Nmap now with the 6 option, if we Nmap help, scroll up, you'll see the 6 option as a way to specify that we scan IPv6 addresses as opposed to IPv4, which is the default option for many utilities that allow interactivity with IP version 6, and that is to turn on the 6 option. You can also dump the help and grep just the number 6, for example, and you'll see that 6 enables IPv6 scanning. So if we end map, and let's click off to the side so we don't copy anything. The same host, but this time without the IPv4 address, we'll do an in-detail scan using the 6 address. And let's attempt to paste that address, and we got the wrong thing pasted because we blocked inadvertently with PuTTY. Whatever you select is ultimately blocked. So let's copy this block of text by marking it and then with DOS or the DOS window it's a bit anemic in that you have to go through this little dance to get it to mark something and then copy it so let's then paste the address and have it perform an IPv6 scan this will tell us whether or not the MySQL instance is bound to IPv6 which will help us to determine how to filter traffic inbound to the server whether on an external firewall and or on the server itself using perhaps Windows Firewall or some third-party firewall software. Now, so far, if you notice in a dump, it does not appear that 3306 is published. We see other ports such as DNS, CIFS, terminal services, but we don't see 3306. So, so far it looks as if we don't have to worry about MySQL being bound to IPv6, which raises the question whether or not it supports it.
perhaps via an additional directive, or perhaps the support's just not available just yet. So that's a good thing, one less worry. And if we scroll through the lists, we see ports that are in the ballpark, but not MySQL. So nothing to worry about in that regard, but certainly a bunch of other ports and services to worry about. So that's the state of affairs. Now we can dump a database to a MySQL or a MySQL database to a SQL file and import it over on the Win side. For example, let's MySQL dump from this side. So MySQL dump with the help option, you'll see the various ways we can run it. We usually specify the database after we've authenticated. But if we want to dump a database, we specify the database name and the help is actually exceeding our screen here, but let's just pipe it to less. And you basically specify the options such as authentication followed by the database name and optionally some tables. So we could do either or, for example, let's MySQL connect as a user root to the local instance by just using MySQL prompt. And once we're in momentarily, We'll do a use, and let's do a show databases first to see which one makes sense to interrogate. Let's do a use LCBT prods demos. And this is a database that we'll create over on the win side. So let's copy its name and paste it into our notepad window since we'll be using it with the create database ta SQL statement. So we'll be doing a create database followed by the following name momentarily terminated with a semicolon of course and let's use the database uses one of the few commands that doesn't require a semicolon at the end of the line and then we'll do a show tables to see how many tables exist only three tables we could pick a specific table dump it and then import it such as the demos tables so for example mysql dump We'll connect as the user root prompt for the password database LCBT prods demos table demos and this will dump to stand it out once we authenticate the contents of the demos table. But that isn't ideal. What we want to do is put this in a file. So we'll send it to a file. We'll call it LCBT prods demos dot demos TBL dot sql so that'll dump the contents into the file once we've authenticated let's authenticate and then echo the exit status and less the contents of the newly created file so now we've got a sql file but of course it requires a container on the remote side so we can create that container remotely or locally if we wanted to do it remotely we just use mysql connect as let's say the user linux cbt will be prompted for a password and we'll execute the command create database lcbt prods demos terminated by a semicolon this prompts us for authentication and then we'll log in using the appropriate password for the user linux cbt and it tells us because it wanted to connect locally we didn't indicate the host's address which makes a lot of sense so let's give it its address of 105 so it doesn't attempt to connect locally then let's re-authenticate or authenticate to that remote system and have it do a create database. So let's echo the exit status. So we assume all has run well. We can always use our MySQL show command to show. So MySQL show from the Nick side. Connect as user Linux CBT with a password of ABC123 to the host 192.168.75.105. And we'll have it just show the databases, which is the default. So this will connect, not prompt us for authentication, and dump the databases. Notice the newly created database. So the database is available on the remote side. Notice that all the databases are lowercase. So now, and Windows tends not to be case sensitive. So now we want to import the data stream. So we can import directly from the local NIC server into the local Windows server using the MySQL command and redirection. That's one way of doing it. Or we could copy the file and do it that way. Perhaps the easier way is just to pass the file in to the MySQL command. If we wanted to do it from the Windows side, 
we need to have a way of getting the file from the Nix side. So since we know we can use the MySQL command to do it, let's examine it this way. So let's navigate out of this directory. First we need to be sure, let's go into temp as a location, that we have a client that can pick up the files like psftp. It's not in our path, so we'll have to execute program files putty psftp and that's pscp we want psftp so we'll execute that and have it connect as the user root to the SUSE enterprise box this will give us an interactive interface on the SUSE enterprise box momentarily and that's not 150 that's 50 and this should prompt us momentarily it's going to use the username root once we're in interactively, we can pull the file that we created and then use MySQL import to import it. Or from the Nix side, we could have used MySQL and input redirection. So now we're on that remote side. Let's LSL to get the file that we're interested in. Doesn't like the L option, so we'll LS. That's LS LCBT or L star. And then we'll mget L star SQL. So now we have the file on the win side. So if we use Notepad to take a look at this file, we'll see what it contains. WordPad will do a better job of showing it. But this dump can now be imported into the appropriate database. So to import it, we'll use MySQL, connect, let's say, as the user Linux CBT or as root prompt for password or indicate the password on the command line indicate the default database which is lcbt prods demos and then input redirection the name of the file this is one way to do it another way to do it is to use the mysql import command mysql import and if we type that out we see the options this has a an option to specify the file we scroll towards the top and we see mysql with the authentication options the name of the database and the text file to use to apply against that database so mysql import is the desired method so again we'll connect as linux cbt with a password of abc123 when using the lowercase p option ensure that the password is not separated by a space from the p option as we've indicated plus the name of the database which is lcbt prods demos followed by the file name lcbt prods demos so since this throws an error to misinterpreting the command doubling up the name of the database let's use the mysql command which will definitely work so that's mysql user linux cbt password and we can always debug the MySQL import command offline. Perhaps it doesn't like something specified in the dump. The name of the database, LCBT prods, demos, it's case insensitive on Windows. And input redirection, the name of the file. Notice no errors, no nothing. So let's connect using MySQL. User Linux CBT, password ABC123. And we'll default to LCBT prods demos so that we can execute commands directly against it. So now we're within that content slit. Context, let's show tables. And let's select star from demos. And there's everything from demos. So it's working. Now let's confirm that we can see this information from the Nix side. So MySQL show and perhaps we will show the specific database lcbt prods demos and this will authenticate against 105 and show us the contents of that database which includes its demos table and then if we show demos it'll show the description of each of those fields and of course we could execute commands like MySQL user Linux CBT password on the command line. Since this is just for demonstration purposes, we can get away with it. Followed by an execution of select star. Or if we select, if we indicate the database first, then we can always tell it which database and not have to change context or just indicate the full path. So select star from 
lcbt prods demos dot demos. That's always a direct way to get directly to the data that you're interested in. And we did indicate the hosts, so we knew we left something out. That database doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't allow us to connect locally, that is. Not with that password. So this will bring all the records back, which means the import was successful. So debugging the MySQL import is a small task. We can always figure out what's off, what doesn't it like about the file or the options that we specify. But you know that you can import using the standard MySQL client any of the data that you have. So we've looked a little bit at using the MySQL server on the Windows side. There are a number of other things that you can do, such as use the GUIs for administration as opposed to terminal monitor and these loose set of tools. But the tools always are helpful because it helps you to quickly with as little bandwidth as possible manage your server and of course to automate your server.